Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Not that. Okay, so thank you all for the, for coming this afternoon. We appreciate it on Friday. But we promise also to deliver very interesting presentations. I hope you, you join them, you, you engage as well in the discussion. Um, so this afternoon, we have um, a, a set of as I said, set of presentation of course, two sessions. There is um, a break uh, for coffee as well, to keep you um, coffee. Um, and the first um, session, therefore, because we are running a bit late with the Zoom, was, um, as you saw, with another um, um, teaching, um, normal teaching class. Um, so the first session today, um, I'm going to call for Bruno, Christopoli, uh, and Bruno, and Dr. Bruno Los Santos, please. Uh, I don't know if the both of you are presenting yeah. as well, Bruno. Um, thank you very much for giving you with your Thank you so much. And finally, just to say that we are recording the session. No problem. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. I'm very happy to actually see a very full room. Very happy with that. Uh, my name is Bruno Santos. I am an academic with the School of Human Sciences, and I'm part of the Chemistry and Pharmaceutical Science Cluster. With me today, during the second part of this presentation, is an exceptional, exceptional is the correct word, PhD student, Mignon Christofoli, which will um, tell you a bit more about the nitty gritty when it comes to the science part. So she's not only the muscle behind many things that you see here today, but also the brain behind of this whole operation. And we're going to be looking at Dyclofenac. Probably some of you already know what Dyclofenac is and means, but I'm going to start by explaining exactly that, what Dyclofenac is, if I can change the slide. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to give you a brief background information about Dyclofenac, and then Mignon will tell you more about the science that we've been discussing in the lab and doing in the last throughout now many years. So starting with diclofenac, it is a very important anti-inflammatory drug. Probably most of you that probably have like muscular pain in the past actually use diclofenac. You can take it as a tablet, as an ointment. So because it is so famous, it's used in many, uh, in many anti-inflammatory diseases. And this means osteoarthritis, which is an anti-inflammatory disease that affects more than half a billion people in the world. So again, because I like it's so important in our daily lives, and it's part of, let's say, our pharmacological diet, it is produced in huge amounts. I can tell you that in 2015, more than 1.5 million kilos were produced uh, when it comes to that cost. And as we know, when we mass produce something, we usually have an impact in the ecosystem. And that happened in uh, Southeast Asia, when we started to see that some species of vultures started to die when they were feeding from the carcasses of animals that were taking diclofenac. So in Southeast Asia, they banned the use of diclofenac in veterinary uses. Besides seeing some of this ecosystem uh, anomalies, even in Europe and in the US, when we start looking at the amount of diclofenac that exists in drinking water. It's not a very um, well studied at this point uh, drug where it comes to the impact that it will have in drinking water. But still, since diclofenac exists in drinking water, we have diclofenac in the reservoirs when it comes to controlling the amount that we drink of it. And this has been happening if you're probably aware that other drugs like metformin, which is for diabetes, we are counting it in drinking water as well. So all of these drugs, we need to start removing it from drinking water. Still, it is very important to understand that diclofenac is, and it will be, continue to be, a very important anti-inflammatory drug. So we'll continue on using it. So our idea in the lab was, can we continue using diclofenac, but reduce the amount that we put within formulation? 
and this means capitalist, capitalist, capsules, ointments. Can we reduce the amount but still get the same pharmacological outcome? And this means the cure. So that was the idea behind all of the work that we've been doing, trying to take a more sustainable approach, a greener approach in terms of manufacturing this such important anti-inflammatory drug, but attaining the same type of results. Now, to do so, when it comes to our area of expertise, which is the skin, and for those of you that don't know, the skin, and in a nutshell, the skin is made of three main layers the epidermis, the dermis, and the epidermis, the top, the bottom. To overcome the skin as a barrier, we have to overcome the epidermis. Now, the outermost layer of the epidermis is called the stratum corneum. So, every drug that wants to pass from the outside to the inside will take two different approaches, even. A passive approach that you can see down the slide, or an active approach. Now, in an active approach or an active method, we usually disrupt the skin. But by disrupting the skin, we might be destroying the skin. We don't want that. So, our approach, when we went to the lab and tried to mimic a different type of formulation, was to take a passive approach. But a passive approach that could again reduce the amount of diclofenac in our formulation, but still attain the same pharmacological outcome. This means again the cure, the anti-inflammatory aspect of nitrogen. Uh, so to do that, we took the approach of transforming nitrogen into an iron pair. So to describe all of the iron pairs and what we've been doing in the last, we need to Thank you. So I'm going to try and use. Um, the diagram you see on this slide to explain what our pairs are. The, what looks like a light blue brick wall represents the outermost layer of the skin, the starting screen, and what you see in the circle is a positively and negatively charged iron. Now, individually, these um, are very difficult to, uh, it's very difficult just to partition and permeate into the skin if they're high enough. It's the skin is in the skin Well, for this purpose, we use what we call partition processing studies. Now, partition processing studies, for some of you who are going, they're a bit like a lot of steel and lots of For those of you who don't know or who, who haven't done one for a while, we basically want to see how much do I base in the environment 
Thank you very much. That concluded the very first step of our research. Now, I just want to say thank you very briefly to all of my supervisors and uh,
Um, Minion's USB stick. Someone borrowed it to download a talk. Can that ring a bell with anybody? No, no, not Bruno. There was a lady who was saying. Oh, uh, USB memory stick. They couldn't Somebody. Oh, there we are. There we go. Down there. No, we don't need to borrow one. We can borrow one. Yeah, she had it. Yeah, I have it. She had it. There we go. about, which we did, the effect of musculoskeletal injuries on mental health. Um, it's a big topic, so it's going to be just uh, an introduction to research. The research is not finished by any means, we are still analyzing the data, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and what is appearing from the data, although it hasn't been analyzed and tallied yet. Um, so, why did I think about this research? First, a bit of introduction about myself. I run the um, sports injury clinic in the science center. I teach sports therapy to level six to level seven. And we run the clinic. Some of you might have been in the clinic, or some of you will might want to come to the clinic and it's there. So why are we doing, why are we doing this? Um, there's been some changes uh, in the years. So I run the clinic since 2013, when I started working here, uh, we have seen a lot of type of injuries, a lot of sports injuries, a lot of athletes coming in. But then things changed a little bit after COVID. So during COVID, so when I say things, I say patients and injuries sort of change. You can understand what I mean in a minute. Um, after COVID or during COVID as well, a lot, a lot of people have found some happiness in the sport. And they pick up sports that they cause a lot of injuries, like running, or even for people that are very active, they started to walk more because they made them feel better, because they couldn't be out of the house. So when we opened the clinic after the lockdown, the patients that started coming in, uh, they had different type of injuries, but it is not the scope of this presentation. But what appeared is that the mental health was very affected. Of course, they've been COVID, and of course, all of us have been affected by COVID and the lockdown. So that was sort of normal. So we thought, okay, these people are really anxious, really down, really depressed. But it's, you know, they might call that from COVID. But then there was something even more different, like how those injuries started to matter to patients a bit more. You know, some people would come in and say they have pain in the back of the heel. Okay, we're thinking of the Achilles tendon. We started treating them. Normally, they used to be quite fine with it, and maybe quite fine also to rest. But after COVID, it became like the worst news that they could hear that they have a problem with the tendon. And like, my life is done, you know? I said, okay, you know, why is this so important to them now, this sport? Why taking the walking or the running or the swimming, whatever they were doing away, started to have a bigger impact? in their life than it used to be for COVID. So that was one thing that, you know, appeared a bit abnormal. And then the other thing, and that was a bit more interesting, is that the injuries were not really very good. So the treatments were longer, the results were slower. So we started discussing in the clinic. So the therapist and myself started talking about it. And we, are, we realize these people are very affected mentally by their injuries. And I think mentally, the well-being, we're not cancerous, so we can't really affect mental health, but we could see how down the patients were. And now they felt that they were so desperate to go back to the school, and also they were not recovering very quickly. 
this. So we said, can we help? Can we help the patients to not just feel their injuries, but speed up the healing of the injuries, and also make them feel better as a whole, not just, you know, your foot is better. We had a bit of look around. This is us, by the way. It's my child and two graduate students, ex students, they run the post injury clinic with me. And we were all, you know, discussing the matter and try to find solutions. We had a bit of a look and then why these patients keep coming to us as well and pay for treatments and why are not being seen by NHS? What happened in all these months, for example? Some people had an injury for like six months that haven't been seen yet. So we had a bit of research around, we had a look around, and yes, we found this kind of information. The waiting list are extremely long. So when a patient is you know, they might have a quite of a minor injury, and for that reason, has to wait about 12 or 18 weeks to be seen. What happens, basically, in those 12 weeks, in those 18 weeks? This is what we wanted to find out. So before they receive the treatment, and they're waiting for so long, what happens? When, okay, Let's say, let's keep this an example of the foot, it's only because of pain on the foot. It will heal. If it's a tendon injury, the defensive foot, and you notice the tendinopathy, it will heal. And even heal by itself if you leave it alone. But it will take like 18 months to heal by itself. But it will. They're not going to die from it. They're not going to be hospitalized. They're not going to be in a wheelchair. But what happens? They get stressed. Stress of what? Of anything, pain, maybe not being able to do the sport, not being able to carry on to the thing that maybe they discover during COVID. COVID. A lot of patients never exercised before, but in the people like that, they found like this amazing thing called starting walking and running. They lost weight, cardiovascular system performed better. Some of them said, they found a different identity through the new sport and the new activity. So that little injury, although not so severe, the movie would have better by itself, took away the thing that liked the most of the time. And it's something with the identity and not to back to that too. So they found they feel very down. And then the stress almost are elevated because of that. Not just because of pain. Well, because they're not being able to do what they enjoy to do. <laughs> so the stress hormones are there as a very common response to stress, it's not a call I guess. But one particular one called cortisol is one of the stress hormones of the fight and flight response. So it's actually very helpful in the beginning of a stress situation or a trauma. But then if it stays elevated for a long period of time, it becomes a body. You start to do things like this. It starts to provoke the digestion, nausea, heart palpitation. There's only some of them. But look at the last three depression, anxiety, and weak immune system. So, weak immune system, for example, what is it going to do? More, more virus risk. Some of the patients have COVID four times. Four times. And then, what about anxiety and depression? Who can live with that? So medication is given. I don't want to linger too much on the consequences of having these conditions, because I think you all know, more, you know, that they're not just, oh, I feel a bit fed up. It's like quite detrimental. What about healing? So these patients were very dark, very upset, they were very They were crying, some of them were actually crying in our clinic. We never experienced that in so many years of being a therapist. Sometimes, but usually it was more because they tell you about they break up, they divorce, or somebody died. You know, they were kind of tough like that. But in this case, they were actually crying about not being able to do the sport. And stuff. so it changed. But what about me? Why do we not? Okay, we fixed me. But it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was a bit longer. Why? Because cortisol 
as an effect on healing as well. So he interferes with the production of the anti-inflammatory, which then slow down the healing process that puts the, that puts the body in a chronic state of inflammation. So not just the injury itself, not just the area, but the whole body in a state of inflammation, which we call chronic inflammation. And letting the body in that state of inflammation can cause many, many diseases including cancer, for example. And also, talking about the local injury, very, very slow to heal. So not responding very well to treatment because of this elevated cortisol level. So we thought, okay, now we sort of think about the reason why these patients are feeling really down they're feeling really depressed, they're feeling very anxious, even if they are only problems with their muscle tendon. It's not so much the pain that they feel, it is as well, but it's also the fact that they cannot perform the things that they want to perform, the sport. And, you know, the happiness that they found within that sport. So the injuries that we, that we see are many. We decided then, but how it said something now. To look at this, we thought, okay, let's do a research about this. Very simple, very, very simple, like qualitative data. So semi-structures interviews to a, a certain amount of patients, in that case about 16. So the 16 patients are going to be interviewed, and they will tell us about their story, the story about the injury and what the injury would have caused. The patients that we see, they were not, okay, that will be good because they had such a dramatic story behind them. And some had, but some were very simple. Some that were literally like a bit of pain on the knee or a twisted ankle. Um, there was like problems with a, some knee pain or some superficial issues, ankle strain, lower back pain. You know, they were so random. And some of the injuries were really, really minor. But we put them there on purpose because we didn't want to just show the effects of these injuries on somebody's life and they had many conditions. Some of them did. We had a patient that, for example, was recovering from cancer and had fibromyalgia, which is such a painful condition, and also some other musculoskeletal injuries, more than one. So we had that case, for example, but we had lots of patients that had a very minor injury. So we put them all together and interviewed them all, not just the ones with a very difficult condition. So we started analyzing the data. We are we almost finished. We are more than halfway through. And we were actually quite surprised to see the results of what the data is actually suggesting. I can't call them results yet. What the data starts to indicate. And anyone with any injury, so you know, the person that was recovering from cancer with the fibromyalgia and the person with the Achilles tendon problem, they were seeing the same thing. Exactly the same thing. So the people that came out was that here I was scared, I was terrified this is when the injury happened. They were worried. They're looking at people that came out of the interview. They were stressed, depressed, I didn't put all the words there. We have many. But the one that they keep appearing is terrified, scared, worried, anxious, frustrated. They all have this in common, even with the, you know, with the simple injury. So, what they were scared of in the interview seems to appear. What they were worried about? They were not worried, this is better than I get my leg, I thought. They said when they had an injury, first they were worried because they didn't know what it was and how the, you know, the consequences of the injury would be. But they were feeling terrified and they used this word and they were scared and they were worried and not being able to continue with the sport. And a few of them had mentioned the sport to come their, their identity. So they felt lost. So this is what is appearing now. So what are we concluding from this? 
can we help them? Can we help them by treating just a simple act of praise or tending to them? Can we actually help them with a mental health? And I, so what is appearing from them to be yes. Because once we fix that thought of that need, and they can go just even just walking or running, then when they take their identity back, this is when they're not worried anymore, they're not scared anymore. This is why they start feeling more happy. And this is when the cortisol levels will be free. And therefore, make them feel better overall. So if you go back to the slide, we're talking about depression, anxiety, digestion, nausea, and low immune system, we can probably treat all that just by treating a muscle thing to be And the reason why we want to do that is because to give a message to NHS that uh, you can't ignore this injury, you can't make them wait for you. Okay, that's what it means, then you deceive. No, because it's affecting everything else. It's not just don't run anymore, don't walk anymore, don't play a sport anymore, and then you'll be fine. Yeah, the injury probably is here, and after the same thing, most of them here by themselves, you can use that. Most of them, no, no, most of them. But then what about everything else? So we try to give this message through this little research. We're going to take it further next year to give, you know, give more attention to the injury. That's what we're going to say to the test. Don't send patients away without information whatsoever and just rest. Because you're affecting everything else. And then maybe my question to you is, well, what about the patient going back then to NHS with something much more major that costs more money to the NHS to fix? Than it would have been an answer for <coughs> amazing question actually thank you <laughs> because we are thinking to continue this research narrowing and looking at certain population certain age certain gender and stuff like that or certain sports or certain injuries so no we put them all together so then we go from early 20s to mid 60s yes yeah. and Again, you know, when before you start interviewing people, you sort of expect them all the same. And my therapist would say, maybe that wouldn't be a good candidate. It's not going to say anything because it's just people sitting fine on the case of the clinic. And I said, no, we're going to ask them all. We, we, we won't give more participants. It's just this 15, 15 if we have agreed. Um, no, completely different age, thought. Um, occupation and gender, there's a very, very wide, wide picture, and they don't seem, it doesn't seem, it's not that all the people seem a bit more resilient and a bit more access, accessible, we see the same thing, and the younger people, exactly the same, they don't appeal like that expectation, the younger people tend to be a little bit more less concerned, they look less bothered, they share less, and the older people tell you everything. But when it came to the actual interview, everything's an hour. There were long interviews, some like uh, 15 minutes an hour, and they tell you everything, and it's the same thing come out. From a small injury, that's why I gave an example of the, the patient uh, that was recovering from cancer, so the story is horrendous for many reasons. And we thought, maybe we'll have to take it away from the study, because she's going to say, mm, she didn't say anything that was more about injury, was not more or less than the one that had a that's why it's so interesting. She was affected the same. And the results of a treatment have also improved all of them. And they were phasing us forever in this interview. This was not a due to the clinic, so we had you know the data we left together. We were so rewarding to hear how the life has gone back to the way it was or even got better. Some of those patients are not even into the room, 
But it comes to talk about the parties in the country, because they think, I don't want to be into the game. There's so many things I could tell you about. If we educate them, we tell them what it is. I didn't put it in there, but one of the things that came out straight away was the fact that they were never told what they were going to go when they went to active and emergency. They were always told to just a tissue injury, just for home. Well, we tell them exactly what to do, exactly what the options are, you know, from doing nothing all the way to the surgery. The ones that we needed to repair, maybe to the neurophysics, we did. So there's, we know, we tell them what to do, and this is a big step forward for them. Okay, at least now I know. Even if I have to rest for a week or something, I know why. And I know what to do. Yeah, I know what you mean, because obviously when you want to do a research, you want to look at the big kind of population. So these types of studies and these types of data collection, even just eight to ten, eight to ten is just a menu. Um is a method of I'm not gonna go into the method study the short time but you need to look at these interviews are really long and they recommend about eight to ten, they are fifteen. Um so you know, a little bit of the population, but it gives you an idea. So this research is not a PhD like the other side is doing. It's a little bit of a research. It's a little tired of bring the goals to better research and longer and more following. It's an idea. You know, when you're going to get a lot of people, it's a little bit of work. It's a little bit of work. You know, a few people look at it. Okay, it seems to work. And that will encourage other people to do the research. Okay? Yes. Because it's short enough, so that... <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> All right. Lots of um, discussion around Rafaela's um, presentation. I'm sure there will be lots of time. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I'm sure there will be lots of opportunity to sort of discuss, you know, the implications of that. I'm, I'm, a lot we could talk about it, you know, the, the chronicity of, of conditions and how that drives quite a lot of cytokines and all those things. But that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different issue. So, um, 
I want to talk to us today about this study that was done um, a while back, many, many years now, um, but I just thought to share that as one of the things I've done before, and if there are people who are interested in clinical trials, you know, that we could have conversations around this at some point. Okay, so the title of what I'm talking about today is Combined to My Clinical Division on Tax Specific Training. The impact of that on operating functional recovery in people with chronic um, stroke. And it was a double blind randomized control trial. And these are the, the gang of people who are involved there. Um, so um, these are all the different papers that have come out of it. The first one was the one that was, that was the beginning of it. Then the two other ones are the papers that sort of come out of it. So all that I'm talking about are already out there in the, in the published literature. It's already published literature. So what are we talking about now? Stroke is a very, very common condition with a lot of us will be very familiar with, either in terms of people that we know who have stroke, or people that you know we've seen on the street, on the on the cheap or whatever, you know, with, with stroke. It's uh, one of the leading cause of death in most societies, including the, the Western world, and it's the leading number one cause for long term adult disability. Now when I say disability I'm not only talking about um, you know not being able to walk but also not being able to go to work, not being able to self-care and care for themselves. Um, and that's why it's such a big, big thing um, that the, the government, the NHS, and the World Health Organization as well, uh, you know, putting a lot, of info, uh, a lot of emphasis on approaches to help people with jobs. Now, physiotherapy is a part of that approach, and we help people with movement problems. Uh, but the challenge is that even after um, intensive physiotherapy, up to 50% of patients will still have some upper limb, when I say upper limb, arm dysfunction. Now, why am I so particular about arm dysfunction? Now, when people have lower limb, you know, impact of their stroke, um, generally a tiny recovery is sufficient for them to be able to strut about, okay? Because when their legs are working, you work together with both legs, you know, and so one leg being good can help the other one. But with the upper limb, oftentimes the upper limb works on its own. Okay, when you're writing, you're writing with one hand. When you're doing things, you're doing with one hand. You know, yes, you do bi bilateral tasks as well, but most times your upper limb works on its own. And because of that, if there's a limited recovery of the upper limb, it's much more disabled. And the impact on, on quality of life is that paper by Peter Chow was one of my uh, MSc students who explored um, the impact of of of, of stroke uh, of of non-performing um, upper limb on people uh, with stroke. And one of the things was uh, was an interpretative phenomenological analysis that sort of delved deep into you know the sense of what and and their 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 understanding of their life. And one of the things that came out of that was that people were telling us that it changed their sense of what, their sense of who they are, you know, and that they rely, everything they have to do, they rely on their carers or their husband or their wife to help them to, to do it. And so it's really huge in terms of the impact. So there's a need for strategies to improve the essence of recovery. And one of the ways in which physiotherapists are beginning to think about this is the usual we call adjuvant strategies. Strategies and um, by adjuvant strategies, we're talking about strategies that sort of prime the response of the brain to rehabilitation. So you can prime, you can sort of make the brain more responsive to your training. And so that's what an adjuvant therapy is. So I'm going to tell you about one of those adjuvant therapies, which is what we call somatosensory stimulation. Now, with somatosensory stimulation, what you see there is that. You know, we give low intensity electrical stimulation, so low that, you know, it just gives mild, you know, tingling. You know, so I say, you know, those slender tone machines. 
you know, it's like that. You know, we give low dose like that. We, we can give it to muscle points, acupuncture points, or we can give it to peripheral nerves. And when we do that, what it does is that it sends a, a stream of information through the muscle afferent, and that activates, you know, information that goes to the central nervous system and through the wonderful circuitry in the brain is able to increase the capacity of the motor cortex to respond to exercise. Okay, so if physios are trying to train the patient and because this intervention before they train the patient, the response to rehab is upregulated. Okay, so start lots of studies have shown that with single session of, you know, if you give it one, you know, there's an improvement in hand function. Um, and also there's what you call cortical plasticity. Cortical plasticity is, it, is where the representation of any part of the, or, you know, most of the, all our limbs are represented on the muscle homunculus or the sensory homunculus. So, um, so when you, when they increase the cortical plasticity, the representation of those muscles enlarges. And there's also a concomitant increase in the capacity of that muscle to generate functional ability or functional, you know, movement. So studies, uh, one of the ones by uh, Salmich and Comporto, um, they, they looked at, up till that time when we did this study, there was only one study that had done it um, in, a, in a sort of clinical trial. And um, it was, what they found was that there was an increase in the capacity of individuals to lift, to do a, uh, a, a grip lift task. Okay, but they didn't see an increase in cortical excitability, which suggests that perhaps the reason why they increased, the, the reason why the intervention was not so effective is because they didn't really change the brain. Because what we know in physiotherapy is that for there to be an improvement in the patient's function, the brain has got to change. The brain has got to change. Neuroplasticity has got to occur. If it doesn't occur, nothing changes. So, so what's the aim of this current study? We wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of using human sensory stimulation for facilitating operating rehabilitation in patients with chronic stroke. Remember, we said that even after rehabilitation, people still have long-lasting disability of their upper limb. So these are the kind of people we're talking about. You know, is there any improvement in their function after you give them human sensory stimulation with heart specific training um, um, to, to, to their upper limb? So the hypothesis was that active stimulation, which is a stimulation, will be will yield greater improvement in functional ability impairment um, than sham stimulation. And we also hypothesized that there will be a concomitant or an associated um, improvement in cortical excitability, which is a surrogate or a marker for um, cortical plasticity. So, who are the participants? We to take people from quite a, quite a wide array of areas. It was quite challenging in South London to be quotation. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, we went to this, that we have a register which is situated in my uh, in my former uh, uh, department, uh, the South London Stroke Register, um, and uh, where it, it's been going for the past almost 30 years now, where all the people that have stroke in south, south of the river are registered on there. Everybody put in from there. And then we get also from five NHS sites and so support groups and informal networks and all the work. So what were the inclusion criteria? This were they, the people who had stroke more than three months duration, three months being, um, uh, 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 you know, generally you say chronic stroke start from six months, but we, we did it, you know, from three months and above. They should be able to do the intervention and that you also have this marker which we call the presence of multiple potential. Now studies have shown that people who have multi-vote potentials, I'll explain that later on. People who have multi-vote potentials in the brain after stroke are the people with a higher probability of recovery. Okay? So we wanted to include people who already had a potential to see whether that would, that would help them. We also excluded people with severe problems, with the spasticity, tightness of their muscles, people who couldn't engage with the exercise in terms of having, you know, cognitive dysfunction, or when they have other forms of neurological problem. And that's the flow chart of the of the intervention. So we contacted about you know a little bit around 450 participants, we screened all of them, 
Um, and then we identified one of the people who could be randomized. We excluded about 153, leaving 133. See how it can be quite difficult to recruit. Out of 500, nearly 500, you can only get about 33 participants. We randomized them into two groups, active group and the um, and the charm group and um, the two baselines to ensure the stability of the baseline and I gave them 12 interventions of, of half specific training after the active group after uh, the active group attack to my sensory stimulation and then the charm group had uh, a, a, a stimulation that is not really there. You know it's sham in the sense that we had we had cut the wire and disguised it and told them that they may not feel anything. You know, so so they didn't really know what the intervention was. So it was proper sham. Um, they, and the therapist who was delivered the intervention also did not know which wires was working or not. So, and then we did post-intervention assessment at, um, immediately after, uh, that's a month, and then three months, and then six months. In addition to that, we also uh, assess the uh, postcard plasticity, plasticity, which I'll explain in a not too long. Okay, go wrong. Now, what are the interventions? So, two um, electrical simulation of the median, the radius, and the ulnar nerve. We simulated them at three times perceptual threshold and uh, 30 minutes of individualized fact specific training. And we measured quite a wide range of interventions. So that's from uh, uh, transcranial magnetic simulation, but I don't really have a lot of time to explain that. But I'm good, just going to move it on. For any of you who who does electrical sim uh, who does transcranial magnetic simulation, come let's have a chat about it at any point in time. Um, so that's our data analysis. I'll quickly move on to our result, which is what a lot of people want to see. Okay, so. What did we find out? So this is the baseline. So importantly, what we need to know is that participants were sort of mild to moderate um, severity with, uh, with an ARAC score. ARAC is action research and test maximum is 57. So we can see the baseline, the sort of like mild to moderate uh, in terms of uh, um, severity. And um, also uh, between the chairman of the intervention group um, the term and the, con and the active group that was not significant difference at baseline. This is important when you're doing a clinical trial. Now, in terms of the results, the first thing to note is that there was a significant between groups. This is the most important result that we found. Um, most of the other ones are, are not as important as this one. Now, what we found was that there's a statistical uh, significance between group difference at immediately after the intervention compared to you know the sham. Okay? So between group difference, the only one that was significantly different was the immediate post one. It was not it was not there uh, three months afterwards or six months afterwards. Okay? When we look at within group differences again, um, the baseline to immediate post intervention, three months post intervention, six months post intervention was statistically significant only in the active group. It suggests that perhaps, you know, the active group is doing something more than the sham group. Does that make sense? Um, in addition, we found out that the group, um, the, the change score, um, um, the change score, the number of participants that exhibited what we call the minimal clinical important difference and for our score, it's a score of 5.7, which is 10% of the, of, the, of, the, of the outcome measure. There are five of them in the active group, two of them in the sham group, you know, immediately post, three at uh, six months, and none at um, uh, three months, and none at six months. And the same thing can be seen, you can see for this is muscle activity loss, which is another measure of how well they use their arm. Um, as well, and uh, you can see more of more people are achieving minimal clinical important difference in the active group compared to the other ones. Now, applying statistics to this did not show any statistics between group difference using feature test. So I'll quickly move on to the next one. Um, um, we also did look at we set a goal for each of the participants. Uh, uh, we did set it. The participants set their own goal of what they want to achieve and. Uh, what we found was that they, they were both improved for both groups, 
However, you know, there was a trend towards improvement in the active group compared to the, uh, to, to the sound group. So there was no, um, so in terms of the goals, achievement scale. No between group difference in physical excitability, as you can see on the laterality index and the ipsilesional and contralesional um, CT, which is short intracortical inhibition uh, markers. So in summary, I'll wrap it up. Um, in summary, um, what we can say is that there is a short-term improvement in um, when you use you know, combined somatosensory stimulation with tax-specific training. But the, the, the effect is short-term, um, not lasting up to, not, not getting up to three months. Now, we also saw an, a persistent improvement in the ability to use the alarm, um, and that was only in the active group compared to the other side. Um, at the moment, we're still not very clear about the mechanism underlying this short-term change, but our instinct is that we probably did not treat them enough or long enough, give them enough intervention to be able to achieve a more longer lasting um, impact. So future studies are still being planned. And one of the ones that's currently ongoing is, uh, is this collaboration which I have with people in Brazil, which we published the protocol last year, um, where we're looking at the effects of um, this same intervention in people with sub-acute stroke, that's immediately after stroke and chronic stroke, uh, to be able to delineate all the different mechanisms on the garden. So there's a lot of fMRI studies, lots of transcranial magnetic simulation studies um, that is um, going to be done uh, there. So that's me done. Thank you. Any questions? Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, one question I did. What does it mean, increased dosage? What's the meaning of that? It, it, yeah, increased dosage means uh, um, increasing the length of time that you spend given that exercise. As we know that there's a dose effect in exercise. There's a dose effect. So if you don't give them long enough, the problem will not change the brain. If it's not changing the brain, there's no experience of impact. Yes. Yeah. My, yeah, yeah it's it's just, so thank you. Well, I, I actually expect to see, for instance, any anomalies or changes in, let's say, the autonomic nervous system, like something that the controls versus that I think. We did, we did access all those domains. So, possibly, um, well, when we look at the, the, the study that is currently ongoing now, we're looking at fMRI imaging, we're looking at different regions of interest in the brain. So hopefully we will see parts of maybe the basal ganglia, parts of the you know the brain stem that are changing. That will give us insight into maybe these autonomic you know effects as well, but not in this current study. Yeah. Uh, thank you, I'm just question Yeah. Interesting question, but there are two different paradigms. Now, this paradigm relates to um, it relates to the motor system that you're priming the motor cortex. So the relationship between the sensory and the motor cortex, you know, that long latency reflex, you're priming it and making it more um, easily expandable. So that when you now superimpose on top of that a training the patient can respond better. So that's this paradigm. Now the paradigm you're talking about is dual task here, which relates to information processing capacity of individuals. So when you're doing a cognitive task, as well as another task, regardless of whether it's upper limb or lower limb, your information processing capacity is taken away by that cognitive task, leaving you with less information processing capacity to deal with your motor behavior. And so when you, we use that during training to ensure that people can optimize that 
information processing capacity when they have problems like Parkinson's, like stroke. Does that make sense? So they're slightly different in terms of. Um, we, if I'm if I'm doing balance rehab, for example, I could give an upper limb task, okay. Um, or if I'm doing upper limb rehab, I could make them sit on a gym ball, okay. And what that does is that it takes away their abdominal muscle, their trunk muscle, you know, because you know they are involved in that space of postural adjustments, and so they get engaged with sitting on a gym ball, making them less available for. Con, con, for contributing to the kinetic chain of a movement. And because of that, you can improve their capacity to, to, to use the opponent. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, let's have a chat about it. Okay. Thank you so much. No worries. I don't think we have time for any more questions, but over the course,
Okay, so that's one of those, I guess, happy accidents in the sense that I started branching across into more physiotherapy research as well, because obviously there's a real personal need uh, for that. This once was legible on the front screen. Uh, unfortunately, it getting uploaded and it's kind of removed from the background, but for those of you that can't see that, uh, this research paper is all about pain rehabilitation for patients who have been hospitalized with COVID-19. And this was a qualitative based study. So you may have been aware that something happened within 2020. It wasn't much fun. It was um, a lot of people's work, or everybody's life, but turned upside down. Of course, I am talking about the impact of COVID-19. Uh, which is defined as a severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, coronavirus 2. Essentially, what happens with people, uh, not that you really need much explanation, but for posterity, um, people would often experience anything from um, no symptoms whatsoever, so they're asymptomatic, all the way up to multiple organ failure and death. Um, what was also found is that patients with underlying health conditions were at more severe risk than those without. Um, and 17% of patients admitted to services required some form of high dependency care or intensive care. Now, even if people manage to recover from COVID, of course, we've uh, become aware of this term long COVID. So this can be defined as any time in which participants experience from initially having COVID. These symptoms can include anything from uh, fatigue, breathlessness, uh, brain fog, so people would often find it difficult, uh, difficult to be able to concentrate on periods, as well as chronic pain. And uh, people who had been admitted to high intensity care and had um, had a ventilator fitted were more likely to have mobility impairments, anxiety, pain, and depression. So obviously this all came about and um, caused um, hospital services and the NHS within the UK severe problems, certainly with the health and well-being of patients, even those that um, recovered from the experience of COVID. Um, there was a real need, one, for some form of rehabilitation for patients, and two, um, as well, one that could be done within the confines of lockdown. So from looking at the research evidence, there was limited evidence relating to COVID, obviously because COVID was pretty much a brand new illness. Uh, and also we were very much concerned with how effective can some can a physiotherapist be when they are undertaking rehabilitation of someone that isn't presently in the room with them. Because there's a real, obviously, well, on, on, in one sense, there's a real issue there in relation to how one's effect can be, but two, if we can find effective treatment, obviously then the potential to impact, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people's lives theoretically would be possible if we could conduct something much more effective through the course of, um, I guess, um, virtual, uh, virtual rehabilitation. So for these reasons, uh, myself, and my collaborator, um, so the lead author of this is Dr. Claire Killenbach. She's head of physiotherapy at the University of Hull. Um, and we have worked closely together for a number of years. This was our latest um, NHS funded research project. Um, and we're very much interested in the lived experiences um, of patients and participants of the tele-rehabilitation program to get that real richness of data, that real understanding of what their experience is like so we could help to hopefully build upon that in the future. So to do this we conducted uh, semi-structured interviews um, over Zoom and Teams or whatnot. Uh, we analysed this through thematic analysis and we viewed this through a critical realist um, paradigm. So in the sense that there is an objective reality, we just can't see it, but we can still understand people's experiences as best as possible to try and influence um, interventions moving forward. And from this, we recruited a convenient sample of participants, um, pretty well in the balance of six, um, six females and four males. Um, and typically, these were uh, middle to later age participants, or even age of 62, which I guess you would expect 
because a large number of these participants um, had been in intensive care with COVID, and obviously that was much more likely to happen if you were or slightly older and if you had any pre-existing health conditions. So the um, tele-rehabilitation program was developed by an accredited SNC coach. Um, it was individualized to all participants based upon their ability and their conditions. Um, it lasted for six weeks with two sessions per week, uh, covered everything from cardiovascular training, flexibility, strength building, as well as educational sessions, uh, which discussed, I guess, the psychology of exercise, managing fatigue, managing symptoms, and so on. So we had um, five um, key themes emerged from the data here. Um, obviously, um, I don't have too much time to go into all of those, but I'll just present some of them and do, I guess, a brief highlight for you, if you will. So uh, the tele-rehabilitation program as part of the COVID-19 journey, I'm going to emphasize that last word there, journey, as we will soon find out. The tele-rehabilitation program design and um, the delivery of it. Um, the peer aspect, so what the, the, the social um, group dynamics were. The role of the instructor and also the role of technology, both good and bad. So I've really just summed this up in some key insights here, obviously, um, as uh, time is short. So firstly, um, and understandably, I'm sure um, you can get that there was very much initially um, some real um, difficult health, well-being consequences, particularly mentally for our participants. Some of these people had been in some really bad conditions. We had participants that had been in intensive care for up to three months. Uh, we have participants that had lost limbs as a part of experiencing uh, COVID-19. Um, so obviously then when you've been through such a traumatic period, your family's been through such a traumatic period as well, even though you may physiologically be better and well enough to go home, there's still a lot of consequences that are going to be part of that as well. With eight out of ten of our participants reporting some form of anxiety and depression. Um, as you can see from the quote there, this is the quote that I've ever seen in my life with depression. It would be useful for someone to say to me that it's normal. However, this is where the, the program was very helpful in that sense because it helped provide context um, to participants' symptoms and, and also it helps that promote that, that, that feeling of acceptance. Because when you can see other people with those same difficulties that you face, you feel much less alone. Um, and also, people saw where they were, they found that sense of acceptance, and they saw it again as part of that journey. Of this, is, this is the whole thing that I've been through. And this is going to take time for me to build up and recover, but this is all just part of the process. So therefore, these difficulties I'm facing with this exercise is something that's part of it. I accept it. I find meaning within it. And hopefully from that, as then I can grow over time through this program. And then from that, there was some really positive um, well-being gains from the program. Um, people found a real sense of enjoyment and fun. They really looked forward to this. And again, it's placed in that more facilitative appraisal um, upon the whole process, as opposed to seeing that exercise as a burden. Um, another key part of this, and feeding into that more, that, that well-being um, aspect, was the social aspect of participating in the programme. Now, people, not only did it help people feel less alone in what they've been through, but it also helped reduce isolation as well, because obviously we weren't getting much um, social contact, especially through the really dark days of lockdown. And this helped people, you know, meet new people, still get that social interaction, especially people that they already have so much in common with. And as you can see from the, group, uh, the quote there, we weren't isolated, we did it together as a group, we inspired each other to go further. However, group dynamics, even though things are communicated over uh, a celebrated visitation program that's communicated um, over the internet, it doesn't mean group dynamics still change. Um, there were still obviously a lot of um, personal insecurities relating to exercise, you can see from the quote there. When I saw three men, I thought, oh God, why couldn't there have been another fat woman? So participants still wanted to feel comfortable in what they were doing and it's important for us to consider those group aspects so that people can feel psychologically safe when they participate in something that to be honest is still incredibly vulnerable to some type of a person even though you don't think you never technically met these people you still want to present to them yourself 
Um, the instructor was um, unsurprisingly absolutely massive in creating that psychologically safe environment, promoting a facilitative environment where people felt able to overcome perhaps those personal boundaries and they actually felt a real personal investment as well, which is quite um, quite obvious. Um, one of the key quotes here, you could tell they wanted to be there. That's so important. They really did motivate us. So rather than having that hierarchy between the, um, I guess, the SNC coach as a facilitator and the learners, instead, that was made much more uh, socially constructivist in the sense that the, learn the facilitator was there to empower participants <laughs> be the best versions as they could be. You know, the facilitator was there to help build everyone up rather than being the arbiter of knowledge. So to, oh, there's so many more points I could get into in terms of those themes. If you want to obviously learn more, then please find the paper being published in mind shortly. So just as a short discussion and take home message, the telerehabilitation program was a positive experience for the service users. And in fact, some of the largest complaints that we've had, and one of the biggest issues that we've had, was the fact that it only lasted for six weeks. And we need to consider how we help participants move from NHS based programs into community based programs, because actually there's no funding issue there. But what ended up happening was as soon as that program finished, participants, they, they didn't know where to do because a lot of participants actually then dropped off their exercise, even though they had done so well. Now there's no driver for them to continue with that sort of change. So we need to consider that transition from NHS based uh, tele rehabilitation to community based programs as well and how we can best facilitate that. Um, the group aspect of the program was absolutely essential. The sense of enjoyment, the reduction in isolation, the real promise in the social benefits of tele rehabilitation programs. And what we tended to find is that participants actually exchange social information so after the program they still continue um, to communicate and to have even met up in real life now obviously that has ended. Uh, the personalization aspect both in terms of the content so that the, the exercises were individualized to the, um, to the individual was obviously absolutely essential um, and also the delivery so the facilitator really came out of this with a lot of credit because they really connected on that personal level, and pretty much all of the services reported how important that connection was in facilitating them to start from where they're really anxious about their ability to uh, undertake exercise, the input from us experience, to then obviously really developing through the particular program. And as such, any further tele-rehabilitation programs for COVID or otherwise should consider a biopsychosocial approach because obviously this isn't just a physiotherapy program. The mind aspect of that as well is of huge uh, importance to the success of the program. So here is the publication there. It is open access, um, published in conjunction with the NHS. Um, please give it a Google Scholar search if you wish to read more. I would also happily share the link if anybody wants to go and see that. Um, and that brings me to the end of my discussion with you. So please, if you have any questions, let me know. Any questions from Mark? Lovely So what we often have there, it was a case, it, it, it was a case of simply learning about the different interests or what, you know, it very much person centered care, if you will. So understanding what, um, when you recovered, but, you know, what did you do before you had COVID? What was personally interesting to you? Did you like going for walks, like walking the dog? 
Did you play walking football? Did you, uh, did you like to get the garden in, for example? Well, that film was for the program of design. Uh, yes, he got, he got, this was actually been spoken with the facility. It was also an ongoing process as well. So, like, during the classes, it was a people who were there encouraged to discuss what things were really interested in. So, um, again, the garden would be a good example of when any of the exercises to strength training that they may or may not do then really fed into that. And also the exercises that they were given in between sessions, because obviously it's not a case of, oh, I'm only exercising two times a week. It was a case of giving them tasks such as, okay, well, when you're boiling the kettle, can you sit there for a cup and do something like that? Something that's close to hand, that's easy, that's easy for you to do in a safe manner that we can do without obviously coming into contact with any of people, but still utilizing what we've got around us. So there was still that personal aspect, but there was always that personal sense of what do we need to get that and do? How can we get best do that within the even less constraint, but more a okay, table well, instead what what facilitates us. So it's that mindset shift from, oh, instead of thinking, oh, there's no gym here, so I can't train, it's like, okay, I'm in the kitchen, I've got some things, and I now do this to build myself up there. Uh, so the sampling um, was pretty much, um, it was convenient. Um, so we had four participants in the Celebrated Validation Program. We then sent out uh, contact information, would you like to take part? Uh, and then from that, it was sort of a case of correcting um, some people, how it matched up, and then eventually going into the next program. We have four more. Um, I, I mean, it depends. I think a lot of people have got support for people there. Um, I, that is probably the people that are there to ask them. I, I, I didn't make that decision, so I'll be happy. Yeah, that's a little bit. Maybe, and then I'll do it. That's a bad thing. One of the programs that you need to change. Don't you program the real thing to so I think in terms of this, it was it was always come back in terms of people and all the So, because this happened at the very start of the COVID, um, the one for that era, um, vaccination so much has happened. Yeah, the, the people went to um, ICU and came out of it. The kind of kind of rehabilitation program that's been around here, and the work actually available to vaccine. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So we may continue with the next talk, which is the Council of Professor Yolanda Arasu. So we'll be talking about accessing edge and medical security. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I know I need to be um, to keep kind and um, I'll try my best. So my presentation is about uh, accessing urgent and emergency care in, in winter. And this is about an evaluation that we did um, for the NHS North Central London um, a campaign that runs the winter, the winter campaign last winter. Um, so, the commission did this evaluation just to see how they were doing, obviously, um, with that um, intervention. And you might be familiar with this, it's called Stay Well This Winter. Um, it actually has been running since 2015, but what they were doing here is that every year you have new things to ask, the information. Um, for example, the booster campaign we saw happening last winter. So that was something new that didn't happen before. But this is about um, only ensuring, I and mean, this is the overall aim of this winter campaign, is to ensure people's access to services at the time of high seasonal uh, demands, which is winter. Um, and the second uh, aim of the campaign, and the most important one from the NHS point of view, is to reduce pressure to actually in an emergency department. Um, so you, you might have noticed I mean, some of the information there, the type of messages that were developed um, or for the core of this campaign. I'm going to be referring to only briefly to those that are related to um, accidents and emergencies. Because um, before I go there, I present to be on our methodology. Um, so, to develop this, this, this evaluation, we use the full evaluation framework 2.0, which is um, something that the government communication strategy or services are, are using uh, to analyze how effective are um, campaigns, the communication uh, that they are using. And for that, in this particular campaign, um, was seeking to raise awareness, so there are three different components there. Raise awareness on residents in North Central London, change behaviour in patients on using those services, and affect behaviour change. So there were three different areas, or separate areas, and we're trying to see how effective the campaign was, that communication was, for people to um, somehow change all these three um, um, different components of behavior change. For that, we use a mixed method of complementarity and donation wise. So confusing that word, but it is a way to basically um, <coughs> the, the, the use of separate use of quantitative and qualitative data. And for that, we approach this from the benchmark uh, survey just before starting the campaign, I mentioned earlier that this has been done in 2015, so it's not too new. But what it was new was some of the components that were used last week. So we started with the baseline, which is a general national NHS campaign, and then we had the full campaign survey, um, and then we had one on one semi structure uh, interviews. <coughs> and for that, I, um, I wrote in collaboration. For the, for the, for the, for the tools, uh, for the analysis, and the, Alexa, um, the, the person who conducted the, the interview. We were referring here as a theoretical model as the COMB model, which is about um, capabilities, opportunities, and motivation to develop behavior change. Um, and we also seek, based on that model, we 
uh, try to understand why people are behaving the way they behave, to see a fundamental aspect, to know what we need to change of this message. Um, and we do this, you know, what we call in an evidence-based um, theory of it, that I just mentioned her, so I bring the head in. She did the interview. She is a lady in the interviews that we studied. Um, okay, so I'm trying to speed up a bit to spell this. So, one of the issues, or the most important one, is trying to separate what we do urgent from emergency. And this is a very strong semantic distinction that is unclear. Because if you look, if you look at emergency, as it just moving from the NHS, if you can going to an energy to happen to well immediate response, and then you have urgent um, primary to be speak within primary care. Because those things still in the face of us and require certain attention. So you see the word urgent and um, immediate. And obviously, residents, population at large, as travelers sometimes don't stand for the distinguish between the two. Therefore, messages and the Christmas is about people, but people can understand where to go when they feel ill or they have certain. And condition. So, all these services, and it says someone one, pharmacy, a guard, out of pharmacy, to appointment, all these fit within primary care. Well, and it says someone one, if you know, it's a national um, type of service, which is online, and it's a report. In this primary care, and that fits within actual and emergency, young person in only condition. Um, there's a lot of, um, in terms of the context, or that's a bit, okay, or the presentation, in terms of the context, context, you have seasonal demand of respiratory disease, as I think I mentioned, GP practices still are mostly uh, working in remote, with remote appointments, so there is, um, uh, it's difficult to, to book face-to-face -face appointments still now. By the time this campaign started, there were around 6 million patients on waiting lists for elective care. So that means that the new patients will have to wait until they manage to get into um, primary care services. And then, as you know, problems with recruitment of staff for primary care, including GP practices. So what we know about the evidence is something that I mentioned already, is that distinction between urgent and emergency and um, that people get sometimes uh, confused. As I said, there is evidence here to support this um, approach. Navigating this urgent and emergency becomes a bit problematic from an individual point of view. And then you've got certain terms that can be referred to clinically unnecessary um, individual locations and attending services in active or emergency that they should not have been um, attended there and should have been um, uh, assisting or being attended in, in um, primary care services. If it's a support of the documented that they were trying to be paid with the record. So, as I said at the top, most of what um, counts as, as uh, urgent and emergency care is not an emergency, in fact nothing that requires a critical response. So, in other words, they are not like questioning and they shouldn't be there. And I think Rafael mentioned one example of those <coughs> people with an injury that end up in a room and then are being rejected and um, then end up in certain or other type of services and luckily have seen it. But they are certainly no, not like questioning. I'm going to show a grant here, but this is how we work. I mean, in terms of um, trying to find out pre post campaign, we run of what is called a C test to compare and to try to identify um, statistically uh, significance between the two periods. And 
and you will not appear in terms of awareness of services only on the local schools, pharmacies, and the patient patient audience had the truth say after the analysis, perhaps some effect, so the campaign has some effect in that respect. Um, in terms of people, basically people were uh, saying that after the campaign they knew, right, they knew that local community pharmacy services were available, the GP appointment, the face-to-face -face ones were available as well. For the rest of the services, the campaign did not um, uh, have any any impact. Um, and in terms of intention, um, the campaign has no impact at all. So intention means we ask people, what would you do? It's an hypothetical type of question. What would you do if you were to have an urgent but non life company? Which type of services would you go? Actually, you notice that the campaign did not have at least a statistically significant effect, but it did have some improvement, but not nothing that we could um, refer back as a positive um, uh, for the report. And finally, behavior change, no behavior change was identified for the key services that the NHS was first interested in. Um, so, a bit on, on the interview, uh, because I think that the statistics alone, or the statistical analysis, is not sufficient for us to understand why people behave in the way they behave. So, the confidence that we need also to know uh, a bit more about the behavior. I think the, the first example is a thing that we partner says. You get an immediate response in action and emergency. Someone will actually see you on the bed. Okay, not six hours, which is not a million of friends, not six hours, but at least someone will see you. If, right now, I want to see you, I want to see you more I have to wait probably five weeks. So this is the, the so-called military and medical. And the reason being, it's not that we don't understand the message, the problem is that new studies that have to generate the process of lack of accessibility to this important that leads people to that type of intention, the most consistent um, health system approach that is damaging here, not on, only about messages, not that it's got uh, the campaign from action change for uh, this. We have a context as such as the mission. That is pushing um, people to people's behavior in that direction. A female that is in front of this older female, they are trying to find a working clinic, and other of the um, services that were in the community. And he said, I couldn't find one that I could actually get to. Um, and there are problems with these other things for her. There are new services, extended access cards, the um, Walking clinic for her as new. We never used to have. There is a problem to get into there. That's why people fly to get to the um, A&E. The medical manager says, but why do you know? Basically, he's saying, I don't know anything about, I know that there exists the extended access path, I call basically, and we can that are extended out farther. Um, I, I, I don't know where they are, I don't have, they don't give us the telephone, we don't know how to access them. So I, I, I know they exist, but I feel behavior, there is no behavior change there because I don't know how to do it. Um, okay, so, and, and then this um, gentleman was talking about the difficulties around the digital um, appointments and how difficult they come as well, that's another factor. To access, or how impossible it is find that it's difficult for all the people to access according to the digits. So, some of the recommendations we have, um, this is just a, a, a small uh, um, a summary, really. So, 
the first thing is that you will be surprised, but um, much of the of the NHS campaign that we see in the advertising, I will show you in the whole country, and they don't analyze the behavior of their kind of food. I'm not saying all of them, I've got many, and this is a good example. And so they're trying to change something, but they don't know exactly what, because they don't know what are the behaviors that need change. It's kind of the same message for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and one of the problems is that changing for them the national campaign that the prayer team has been proposed and uh, it's a bit uh, complicated. It's a kind of a bit difficult. They did have in this meeting, they did have a lot of um, working and translation and people, all the organizations working in this now to see for that. They are happening to have the work in the world uh, for people to get to know of messages. And but from a behavioral point of view, so behavioral scientist point of view, it's very challenging to, to work in that way. Um, so we recommended also early engagement with minority ethnic groups um, in order to tailor those messages, or try to tailor those messages a bit more effectively. Um, our audience segmentation, because it's not the same to discuss with, with younger people in person, which are, by the way, one of the higher uses of acting in emergency. It's not the same a message to them than a message to older generation. You can see that the problems are different as well. So we need to know how to address, how to first know the problem, then to develop a message, working with them to understand how they to express that message in which context, in which platform, it's a lot to consider, in fact, in order to have um, some influence in those um, in those messages. Um, okay, so, um, and finally, one final point, because I'm, I'm a heavy time, that's about. Um, yeah, so we suggest not only to focus on individuals or, or residents, there's also a need to focus on the GPs and NHS 111, because they receive people who shouldn't be there. I'm talking about the GPs and NHS 111, in terms of they are the ones who send people as well to A&E, and they are actually as well, as well, Encourage to change that behavior by explaining to people why they should do that. Encourage them to do the best of their services. So, you think that all of those responsibilities are in the In other words, the reason is that it is some kind of self of this person. That means that if you go to the DC, the DC is really a not going to acting in an emergency, just in case what could be responsible, and the same happened in NHS 111. But this is not the thing that is the same, and I'm absolutely responsible that I'm doing very reluctant to it, but this was part of the problem, and the same thing is the literature, the question of feeling these institutions in particular, I think my question is to use the double check on that. And I think I'll like these are the references. I will, we had a report a published as well with um, available in, in our um, repository, it's available online. It's a report. Okay, thank you. Check in, check in, whether the kid is working in practice, 
Thank you. Take it well. So, I'm trying to identify. Okay, so we will uh, continue with uh, Dr. Jim Pastor and uh, some naturopaths and uh, talk about uh, di uh, diabetes related and nutritional uh, intervention. Okay, you understand it's 4.30, almost 4.30 p.m., so we're kind of a bit light. Um, um, we are actually a good collaboration because I'm from the School of Human Sciences and Samuel is his master in your school, School of Social, Social Science and Profession. So we are actually an example of a collaboration here. Um, and our topic, this is Samuel's uh, PhD work. And it was his idea. He came to me. He wanted to do a nutrition intervention in an urban town in Nigeria, where he's actually from, and he wanted to evaluate the risk of diabetes, identify those at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and then um, use this, uh, use those participants, and provide them with a nutrition intervention program to see if it lowers their risk of delayed progress of the disease. So just to give very, very short background, Nigeria is known as the giant of Africa, and it has been, it's currently known to have a high burden of type 2 diabetes. Um, as in this country, a lot of it's undiagnosed, and it's only when they come with Severe symptoms that they realise they have type 2 diabetes. And what we really want to do is capture people before they develop it into full blown type 2 diabetes to prevent um, the other problems that some will, will show us. The cost of type 2 diabetes management in developing countries is also very high, and this makes it much more difficult, particularly for low income individuals to manage their diabetes and complications. And so what we wanted to do was to find alternative, cost-effective, developed, tested, cheaper tools to find pre-diabetes, people who are at risk of pre-diabetes um, in this type of country. So we've developed our program, our study design, and the first step was to assess problems of those at risk of type 2 diabetes using a program called SYNGIS, which has been used in many European populations, but we want to see if it works in the Nigerian population. We also want to see the prevalence of overweight obesity in this population and validate the SYNGIS tool with gold standard blood measurements called HCA1C and fasting blood glucose and then we want to develop and de deliver a nutrition and lifestyle education program to the church setting. And I'm going to hand over to Samuel, who actually conducted this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, just follow up from what uh, you just mentioned. Um, in, this is our, our methodology. And uh, what I try, we try to do is to recruit participants from local churches over there. So initially we put it out and I was able to get about 600 participants. But after uh, using the Pindrick and every other so uh, we cut it down to 581. And uh, like I also mentioned, uh, uh, the Pindrick is a questionnaire that was administered to the participants. And it has about eight questions. I will show you in the second slide. Okay. So this is what uh, the Fringrix. So is a Finnish diabetic risk. So and this is the way what it looks like. It's about eight questions. 
and uh, you ask her the participant the question and it will be scored. And then at the end of the day, you can uh, score it from seven to 11, from 12 to 15, from 15, according to what they have scored. So that's how they look, the physics looks like. Um, in terms of uh, the populations, I decided to use uh, participants from the age of 18 to 65. So uh, the, thing is, the other causes in Nigeria that have used the same tool, there's few of them, and most of them are with a younger uh, population. But I've decided to widen up you know, just to be able to get, track of, uh, uh, get more data from the age group. Yeah. And uh, where this is uh, phase, uh, the third phase, so which is about validation. Like I did mention the other time, it has been validated in other co populations, in European uh, populations, a uh, few African populations, few in Nigeria, but it wasn't uh, further validated. So the uniqueness of uh, this study is the fact that uh, apart from using the Phoenix tool, which is a questionnaire, uh, we also select uh, participants, about 143, just for the validate the tool, and that's by using uh, doing blood, blood testing uh, via HD1AC and fasting blood glucose. And the other uniqueness about the study is we are able to do um, an intervention, which is uh, the fourth phase, whereby we ask participants to come back, and we I was able to do a, um, an educational intervention for, with them for four. So at the first week, when uh, the participants we administered the clinic tool with them again, and the uh, astrometric measure, measurement was also taken. So that's the baseline. And that was repeated at, uh, in the first week. And uh, we also had a follow-up at eight weeks and uh, at 12 weeks. That's just to show the difference. That's just a picture of me with uh, the populations with the participants over there. Right. So in terms of the, the nutritional uh, education that was done with the participants, uh, Right. So what we're trying to do is just to give them, do an education program with them in terms of getting to know about, we started knowing about their knowledge. And uh, I tried to provide an educational intervention with them about how type 2 diabetes can be prevented. So one of the things that we look at is how they can keep their body weight normal and how they can be able to reach uh, looking at their diet, how they be eating. And uh, we all know people like a sweet food, so how that can be controlled. And uh, their lifestyle in terms of exercise, and if possible, not for them not to smoke. <laughs> if possible. Right. So um, like I said, what we're trying to look at is how can people be able to make changes to their diet? And uh, we all know that uh, over there is common in terms of sedentary lifestyle. People sit down for too long uh, without you no know, exercising or without you not know, doing anything, especially with the market women over there. Some of them will start from morning to night sitting and they just eat whatever they have got. So the education was how we can be able to change uh, that perspective in terms of preventing them from uh, to be able to manage uh, the issues. And also, like I said, exercise, regular exercise. Uh, there's a lot of misconception about exercise, about what you can be able to do. So I was able to give an education in terms of what people can be able to do. It's not normally, I mean, sometimes people believe that until you run, mile, you have exercise. But what are the other little, little things that you can be able to do to exercise? So that's part of what we do. 
And the last thing is, how can you be able to lose weight by eating a few calories and then active? Also, we look at uh, the diet. And over there, there's a lot of people, different food, kind of food that people eat. And uh, it's about making them to have an understanding about what is healthy. Eating vegetables, fruits, proteins, drinking a lot of food, and their choice of uh, green fruit. Then we also look at uh, what food to avoid. So uh, I know a lot of people, they like sweets. Sweet, uh, everybody's food. But mm-hmm. we try to look at how can they, be, can, can they eat less or can they prevent it. So we talk about all these things. And then we also look at uh, what food is good for them. And uh, this is just a picture of uh, different Nigerian food, African food. It's not Nigerian food, it's African food that are nutritious, that people can eat, and it's good for them. And uh, we also talk about uh, uh, portion size. Sometimes uh, what people eat, they want it big, massive. So if it is not massive, if it is not big, they believe they are not eating good. So we talk about the portion size. How can they eat small? You know, it's about a combination of different things. Yeah, and then a lot of uh, eating a lot of uh, vegetables. And uh, we also let them know that uh, if care is not taken, this is the outcome of what can happen in terms of type 2 diabetes. Uh, kidney disease, uh, blindness, uh, wounds and application. Just for them to be able to be aware that you know, when you eat good food, healthy food, you live long, and then you, uh, you'll be healthy. And uh, this is uh, in terms of the outcome. What we wanted to say was that, that the education program was tailored for the population. I hope you saw that. That's what we were trying to do. Is it, it, It's not just the average that we, you know, taking a, a nutrition advisory and just putting it into a different setting, but we wanted to tailor it for this population, population that I actually know very well. And it was delivered by people from the community in the community setting. So that was hopefully some of what, why it has been successful. And the first thing we have here is we, we have um, published our paper on the prevalence. Uh, so we found that it was um, about 34% had a risk score of 7 to 11, which is slightly elevated risk. Um, and the ones that came on to do the intervention were those of a uh, risk above 9. And um, these are just some preliminary results that we want to show you. The first one here, you'll see that BMI, this was week one. And what the first thing I want to say is actually we had, we had a lot of people who stayed in for week 12, which is really good. Normally what happens is after week 4, it drops off. But we, we think this, this well, for my, for my um, experience, this is a good participation rate that stays up to week 12. We saw a change in BMI, which is significant. And we also saw a change in weight from week 1 to week 4. And the risk scores we see have gone down using Singlet and the gold standard blood measurement went down for week one to week 12 and that was particularly significant. So we have been able to change the risk for some participants here, which is very valuable information. What we've also done, we also looked at the scores and knowledge and here we saw very, very high knowledge scores which was routine for week 12. Same with the type 2 diet, eating diets, diet, and lifestyle, which again is really good information because this will get passed to the family. And just to round up what we feel is the impact of our study, 
is he's able to modify list categories of some of the participants, include knowledge of type 2 diabetes, age weight loss. We have validated this tool, and that's our next paper of the validation. We saw 80% agreement, which is similar to other tools. And um, we hope this is going to be then used in the population uh, and the same policy for the health promotion in Nigeria. And you're definitely not healthy in some uh, populations. But no, we, we didn't, um, uh, I'm speaking here, but what we, we didn't, we measured and we, we didn't say you are in this category, you're in this category. We just took measurements and said your risk is high and therefore you, you could benefit from coming to our book at the church. Um. Very, very good comment. And I think, and I'm thinking, I think Samuel, I think that helps a lot because Samuel is part of the town. We knew that we know the churches, we knew the pastors, all that helps because that sort of is all your part of the community. Had any of us come in, not knowing them, then it's very different you know, as, as in any yeah. other community. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah just thought of what I just mentioned. I grew up in that community, and uh, one of the reasons I decided to look, use local churches is just because of the fact that, you know, uh, there's research showing that uh, the pastors have mm -hmm. influence yeah. on, on the congregant. So I did make use of that. So prior to going over there, there will have been a lot of meetings, communications with the pastors, just to be able to design the questionnaire. So in time of the Fendrick, it actually it was or even translated to the local knowledge. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So that's we, that was taken into consideration when we were designing uh, the questionnaires and everything. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, just a quick question. You talk about informal policy. I just want to ask you about the uh, prior to starting the uh, the, the study. I was able to get uh, make contact with uh, the Ministry of Health over there. So I now have a letter to, to back it up, which was also presented before I started with my own study. So 
So, and there's an agreement that uh, when everything is done, I should be able to let them know the outcome of this project. So there's a list. So in terms of policy, uh, probably make sure that that's what they ask for. So the copy will be given to them. I need for them to make use of, of that. What was the research design? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we, 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 we would call this a, an intervention. So we, we, it's a quantitative study. You, we're, we're collecting data and not qualitative. But I think it's an important point that we need to sort of think about that as well. And I'm sure we do have some information where we can, where we can utilize that. But yeah, so that's why numbers are different and the type of information we present is different. And you was a big learning curve for Samuel as well, because he's used to quantitative work. Okay. Yeah. He's managed very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. 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 right, and I'm really looking forward to the last uh, talk uh, from Dr. Catherine So, this is Dr. Catherine Can you see I didn't put your paper here? I have to look at this. Okay, hi everyone and thank you for staying. Um I was thinking I'll probably be less looking for myself and maybe <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a research study that I did in terms of the reflection. Um, this is a reflection about um, the ethical challenges that we encounter during the study. Um, and so this is the background. Uh, when COVID began to unravel, we had plans to do a qualitative study with my colleague at uh, London School of uh, no, Liverpool School of Tropical. So this study was going to be exploring uh, uh, the reasons why uh, women ingest clay. And it was also going to focus on risk perceptions and their experiences of ingesting clay. Uh, this had been born out of a health audit that we had previously done in Haringe um, back in the day. So our, our findings do suggest that you know women eat clay in various African cultures from South, West, East, etc. And the reason why they do that is because of nausea, appetite challenges when they are pregnant. However, in this context, it is viewed as a very dangerous practice because some of the clay has been found to have a high levels of lead and acid, which are quite toxic. So the FSA, which is the regulating body in the United Kingdom, has been at the forefront of warning women, pregnant women, not to eat clay. Okay. And Public Health England as well issued a memo back in 2023. Uh, so we've got all those side effects that can result from the ingestion of clay that is toxic, including if it's to do with lower levels of IQ among children, attention span, etc. So despite these warnings that have been going on since 2002, I discovered when I was doing my own today, women continue to be upset. And not only that, they actually are not aware that the claim is quite dangerous. Okay. So against the backdrop of this disconnect, the public health movement and don't be saying we do a shooting phase, we thought to, um, to do a study to find out what's really going on with the women, what are their experiences like, where are they getting the claim from, etc. Because there have been restrictions that have been put in place by the FSA. Wherever they find this clay in these African shops, they raid it, etc. But if women were still eating it, they were finding it from somewhere. So that's what we're trying to figure out in this study. 
However, that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about the experience of actually engaging with the women during the COVID pandemic as it unraveled. Because we then had to do um, uh, remote uh, field work. Previously, we had planned to do face-to-face -face interviews. So um, in the context of public health research, um, migrants are usually thought of as difficult participants to recruit. This is mainly because of Sometimes they're, they're hesitant to engage with officials, etc., and uh, sometimes they are sometimes they are socially disadvantaged and it's difficult to get hold of them. The pandemic made it much more challenging for us to recruit. In our previous studies, we had done to like hairdressing salons, we had done to churches, we had done to men, but now we were like sitting behind our screens thinking, okay. How are we going to get this up to these people? But in, uh, but in the end, we had two very good um, community-based people who were very good to, uh, in terms of recruiting because they knew a lot of people in the community, etc. So that helped. So now, if we could uh, think back to our own experience of COVID, uh, learning online, something that we take for granted. Because when we started doing the, the interviews, and trying to recruit people, we realized that the issue with digital skills was, was much more important. We think about the digital skills, the di sorry, digital device, when we think about the global south and north. We don't think about it in a very localized fashion, but it became uh, quite real for us. So, so I will share those experiences and I'll give uh, examples of what we've encountered. So we received ethical approval from here. We had to think about the well-being of our research participants above all things during this time. And so we, 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 we were not placing undue stress on the participants by calling them in system lecture, et cetera. And we stressed also on the voluntary nature of the study. We kept repeating this more than we would normally do if we're just doing it face to face. Now, one of the key challenges we encountered was obtaining written content and fine content. Because remember, we had put ethical approval before COVID and now COVID too. And when I went back to the ethics research committee, we had a couple of tricks. But in essence, to be honest, it wasn't sufficient because we didn't know what to expect when we then started doing it. We had a consent form that we emailed with experts. We thought they could just download it, download it, and return it. But some of the students do that. Okay. Uh, we could not send them hard copies because remember, this is a hard to reach group. They are reluctant to gain the authority. So the minute you start saying, Can I have your address? That's an added burden. You have a couple of people dropping off. So they couldn't download lack of know how insufficient it still through the internet. Uh, not having access to an appropriate device and also limited access to the internet. And uh, so to mitigate the know-how in the end, we sent the form as part of an email text and then asked participants to respond to the email with a declaration that they had read the content and they agreed to take in part. Okay. Because every time they were downloading it, and then it went somewhere they didn't know where to find it. And then after typing out or printing it out, they didn't know how to then um, send it back to us. So in some cases, it was a case of parents sharing devices with their children who were homeschooling. So you had children who were using their parents' smartphones to be, to be attending classes. So if you were going to be calling for, to speak to the parents, you couldn't. Uh, actually do the interview. So this delayed some of the interviews, so we had to do schedule several times. Um, and similarly, a study by Ofcom showed that, um, you know, financially, in financially vulnerable households, this was the case with children sharing a, a, a single device with their parents. So we could all think, oh, great, you know, we are now all doing online banking, etc. But that wasn't the case with some people because they actually didn't have access 
So there's a lot of digital poverty that we encounter which we hadn't expected. So a few lessons we learned is that if we were to our computer oral consent, which can actually be recorded for those with limited, uh, limited digital skills. But then you can't just then start saying, this is what we're going to do now. You have to have included it in your ethics approval uh, form. Um, and it has to be approved. And um, the other thing that we encountered in interviewing our, our 30 research participants, uh, parental responsibility. Remember, children were not in school, they were at home. So a, a participant would say, we will talk at this time, and then you call them, and they can't talk. And then they'll give you another day, and then you call, and they can't talk. So you needed to, to be very, very patient. And it was not uncommon for calls not to be answered at all. So from an ethical perspective, we were really trying to be as mindful as possible um, to the fact that um, they had limited time and they had a lot of competing claims on their time. And interviews were also in disrupted by young children crying for their parents, etc. you know, and you just had to solve. So prioritizing the needs of children and parents came first when we're doing this study. So what we learned is that you need to exercise a lot of patience, okay, and flexibility in, in, uh, that would enable you to collect um, the data as you go along. And I think from when you are trying to figure out how much time it should take you, it's worth allocating more time to it because it, gets, it then gives you time to maneuver. Because you could spend three weeks just testing the same participants and they're occupied elsewhere. And then we had um, payments. Obviously in research, there are different types of payments that can be made uh, uh, with various ethical implications. But we had a 15 pound voucher, which is a small amount of cash really. And um, we paid this uh, for their time, experiences, and knowledge with us. But then what we found is that um, when we emailed participants with a voucher link, some of the participants couldn't open it. Something we had taken for granted that they would just open it, go to the supermarket, which we can use it. Um, so even though it had instructions, some of them still struggled. So what we had to do was that so you would literally phone the person and say, okay, open the vault, open the link, and then you take them through stage by stage. Um, the voucher also made there some economic challenges that were being experienced by people that caught us completely off guard and unaware. You know, they were supposed to receive the voucher within two weeks, but before then, we were getting phone calls, where is the voucher? I need to buy food for my children. And the case of the woman who went to the supermarket, and she's there with, at the, wherever she was, because she called me and I could hear the noise in the bedroom. I've got food in the basket. I can't find the voucher. You know, and it was quite distressing because it all, you know, you could feel it. That this means the difference between having a meal and not. And it's not something that we had actually prepared ourselves for or to encounter. And then once the voucher for her had been in the junk, I start saying, okay, can we check your junk folder? Have you checked your junk folder? And she says, no, I said, okay, go there and check. And fortunately, she went to the junk folder, found it, and I took her how to, how to open it. Things that we often take for granted. But it, it obviously had caused her a great deal of distress. Now, in our research ethics application, we had given due diligence, so we thought, you know, like everybody else, to do due, due diligence to the thing. And uh, things like time posting those concerns or those unwell, et cetera, and uh, relevant organizations. But we are not anticipated the situation that confronted us. And um, it's raised questions about our preparedness to conduct research in this very fluid context. Um, so evidence does show that um, as COVID hit, uh, low income earners, as those in our sampling flu, 
are bore the brunt of COVID-19. And we have had various reports suggesting that ethnic minorities were particularly financially vulnerable. Now, for our participants, uh, more than half of them were care workers or service, uh, service or industry workers on zero contract, contract, and some of them didn't have income anymore. Um, and now, what was most telling for us is that um, whilst the government had provided you know, money through the furlong scheme and the 20 pound credit uh, uh, for universal credit. Uh, most of these people who fall in the bracket of no recourse to public funds. Okay, so if you have no recourse to public funds, that means that if there is money that is being given to people to support them during this time, you don't have access to it. You cannot have it, you know. And this fell disproportionately on ethnic minorities as some of the women in our group that we were interviewing. A previous study that we conducted with a colleague showed that there were mothers who were not seeking antenatal care services because uh, they had uh, no legal status and they were staying away because they were afraid of being asked to show their documents. So they went to the hospital to give birth as a last resort because they didn't have a choice. You know, so in the context of this study, the issues around the voucher raised, um, you know, concerns about uh, these women and their children being much more vulnerable than ever before in this particular group. I have to say that I have done research and work as a research assistant on HIV projects that have been done here. And I hadn't quite encountered issues to do with a voucher like this. No, so now a question of preparedness. You know, all ethical issues and encounters uh, at all stages of the research process are usually addressed uh, preemptively. I mean, I, I, I'm sure a number of you, you know, have done research. You know that you send in your ethics form and someone will question you, correct that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so most of the time, you are kind of like prepared. But our experiences suggest that conducting research in a pandemic can can raise a lot of issues that you are unprepared for. They may not be necessarily novel but there's very little evidence about it, or it's very, uh, it's not well acknowledged. So what we concluded was that the relative stability of developed countries as we set certain can mask certain vulnerabilities that you would otherwise just readily see, for example, in disaster settings or uh, developing countries, et cetera. So you would have these vulnerable groups, vulnerable groups that you don't necessarily have access to. So the lesson we learned is that it is imperative that in the context of the pandemic, settings are subject to extra scrutiny in terms of the risk faced by research participants known to face higher levels of inequality. So this can develop, this can help researchers to go a long way in developing re uh, responses that um, kind of like address those, the, the crisis. For example, if we had known this is what was going to happen, we would have probably had a list of food banks that we could probably find for uh, the participants to, but it was all in the benefit of hindsight. Thank you very much. That was the other thing I, I, I just had mentioned. They had an expiry date, um, but I think it was like three years after. Yeah, but most of them did actually lose them really because they needed to.
provide some food. Well, I, in, if you are if you are going if you are not going to see the research participants face to face, that it becomes more difficult. I still think the voucher is still a good way of attending uh, participants, uh, uh, but I think you would need to probably invest more in showing them how to open them up or giving them hard copy vouchers mm -hmm. by course if they are agreeable to giving their addresses. That's actually funny because if you are in certain cases with your address, yeah, they are, yeah. So I think would still work in the same way, isn't it? You still have to. Yeah. You need the address. That's what she was saying. Yeah. Because people are reluctant to give their addresses. Yeah. when we put in our application form to really consider the context and think of all kinds of options so that when it comes to doing the research you can't do something because you never proposed it in the in the in the in the in the, in the application. Thank you. What I wanted to talk to finish with our lecture thank you very much. Uh, but, <laughs> but before we leave Five minutes, uh, concluding remarks. Not five minutes. Five, five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> from uh, uh, Professor Ken White from School of Science. Thank you. So, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Yolanda uh, for inviting our school to participate in this continuing series of conferences. I think it's a really, been a really good opportunity for the school to get together and to find common ground. I can see from the questions from the audience that there's a lot of cross fertilization. And uh, I think it's been a really successful event. So I'd really like to give a round of applause for Yolanda for yeah. asking us. Thank you very much. Yeah. And to thank my colleague, Rena uh, May Mary, who has been really helpful and really done all the donkey work in getting our speakers uh, organized. Um, I just want to say, I mean, in terms of the research content, there's lots of intervention studies, there's lots of emphasis on the community. I think London Met is really strong community-based research. So I think it's something we can develop across schools. So that's one takeaway for me. I'm a lab-based scientist. I don't do that sort of thing, but it's really apparent to me that there's a lot of potential there. And I hope we can they'll, they'll have a, more opportunities to interact. And finally, thank you very much to students for coming. I know some of you have to come, but anyway. <laughs> um, but it's really good to see you. Good to have questions from you. And good for us to tell you about research that goes on in the university, perhaps you won't be aware of it. 
and hopefully that will raise your awareness. And as part of our job as researchers to, to, to tell you about what's going on in the university. So I hope we'll have more opportunities to do that. I hope we'll do this again next, next year when we have time as well. So thank you all very much for coming. And um, anyway, have a good day. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Recording now, so it doesn't go through. Stop the.